The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. That issue never came to my office prior to the legislative session. Tonight on Politics Now, we sit down with Governor Steve Sisolak to go over the legislative session. That includes the death penalty bill, opportunity zones, and the upcoming gubernatorial race. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki answers our questions about election reform and changes to the presidential primary. Plus, it is a solution in search of a problem. An election reform bill hits a roadblock in the Senate. We take a closer look at what's next. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm John Langler. Governor Steve Sisolak says not having face-to-face -face meetings kept some bills from passing at the legislative session. This week I sat down with Governor Sisolak to talk about the session, and that was a common theme. Here is part of that interview, and it starts with him answering a question about the Innovation Zones bill. We ran out of time. I still think an innovation zone is a potentially great idea. Uh, if we need to change things that are happening in Nevada, and we do, uh, we need to change how we're funding education. We need to change the diversity in the jobs that we have. We need to change, you know, our, our forward thinking. I think an innovation offers an opportunity. We made it into a study where it's going to be manned by people from the legislature to, to sit down and understand the uh, intricacies of it. It's an important issue. It deals with a lot of different areas, but you have to address the tax revenue and the water situation and the housing costs and the infrastructure costs and all of those things. And the way the legislature was going when it wasn't open to the public and you couldn't get in, and then when people were allowed to call in for public comment, it was limited to two minutes and, you know, per person and 30 minutes total. It wasn't conducive to something of this magnitude. What conversations you and your staff had with the people in Story County before the state of the state? Because, because following that and through the legislative session, at least in my discussions with the county manager and others up there, they felt completely out of the loop. And obviously they're not happy with the idea of if this goes forward the way it was presented initially, it would be self, it would be self-autonomous, self-governing and would be isolated from essentially Story County. Well, we do the best we can to maintain communications with all 17 counties, and that's just it. There isn't just one or two of them. There's 17 counties that we try to stay in contact with. I know that the people that were advocating for the innovation zones met with Story County. Some of the legislators that you know, represent those areas were involved in the discussion, and we had the discussions that we possibly could. Now, can you ever have enough discussions? No. That's why the problem you had with a short session when we're only there for 120 days also with the restrictions related to COVID, I couldn't call a meeting where I had, you know, 25 people come in to the governor's office or the Capitol and say, okay, let's all sit around the table here and talk about the benefits of an innovation zone and what it would provide to the state. There is a death penalty case that will likely be delayed, but it's, you know, there's an execution sort of on the relatively immediate horizon here. How do you feel about the Department of Corrections using experimental drug cocktails for, uh, for the death penalty in Nevada, and do you, would you like the state to alter what qualifies for it, even if the death penalty isn't abolished? Well, that's, you've got several questions in there. I can't speak as it relates to the Zane Floyd case that uh, the DA is bringing forward because that's under litigation right now, and you know, that's working its way through the courts, and, and hopefully they'll come to a resolution in terms of how to deal with it quickly. As it relates to the issue uh, that came before me in Carson City or didn't get to my desk, I was that that issue never came to my office prior to the legislative session in terms of trying to understand what would be uh, palatable for me and my administration and what we'd accept and what we wouldn't. It came out of the legislative session, and I have some cases, having gone through one October, personally, I am not a strong supporter of the death penalty being used as often as it's being used right now. But in the worst of the worst cases, uh, like we had at 1 October, I think that that option should be made available. So we'd have to make some type of uh, accommodation for concerns. But here again, that is such a groundbreaking issue. It's so crucial. People are so passionate on both sides of that issue that you need to have uh, a thorough vetting of that question. And you can't do that when you have Zoom calls and people are limited to two minutes of conversation and you can only get 
10 or 15 people into the conversation to voice their opinion. One of the other issues that was, maybe you would suggest, delayed by Zoom calls and so forth is the ongoing issue with Dieter and unemployment. There's been, I don't know, three or four, I, I forget the number of people who are at the head of Dieter since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and there are still issues that people have with getting their, their benefits taken care of. Um, what needs to be done and what's taking so long? Well, Dieter is a uh, major problem. I don't think anyone can deny that. But you're finding out across the country that the estimates are 50% of the cases that were applied for of Dieter benefits were fraudulent. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars were applied for and money got paid out on fraudulent claims. And we need to do more in concert with the Attorney General and Department of Justice to prosecute those people. That all being said, we uh, inherited a broken system that was never set up to handle anywhere near the capacity that came in as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we put people in there, the system crashed, we fixed it, it crashed, we fixed it, it crashed. Uh, and we did what we can to deal with people but those are skilled positions that people need to be trained for in order to evaluate claims. We're getting them out as fast as we possibly can. Uh, it was unfo unfortunate that it's taken this long, but this is a common problem all over the country. I'm not making excuses for it, but I'm saying that we need to fix the system completely so that next time we run into a situation where the system is strained or put under the stress, it won't totally break down. I'm gonna assume you're running for reelection when the time comes. I am. Okay. Uh, Sheriff Lombardo, Clark County, as you know, and uh, North Las Vegas Mayor John Lee have come out. I'm, I'm sure things will change. You know them well. You've been down here. You know how, how that works. What, key, what do you think are going to be the key issues years down the line for the, what your reelection is that might differentiate you from whether it's Mr. Lombardo, Mr. Lee, or whoever else might be uh, running? Yeah, well, we've got two up north and two down here, so at least four people have already said that they're running. I think what you're going to have to look at is what some of these plans are and what they've done. It's easy to sit back and be a Monday morning quarterback, uh, you know, when you come to these situations. This state faced a pandemic that if it comes once in a century. Uh, is, it's just amazing. It was devastating to our entire economy. We need to make some, needed to make some really, really hard decisions. And I needed to stand my ground and put in mind what was the absolute best for all of the residents of the state of Nevada, the 3.2 million people that call Nevada home. And I believe we did that. And I think we did it as best we possibly can. We were in a situation where we were concerned about running out of body bags. That's how bad it was and how bad the air quality could get as it did in some areas from, you know, the situation that we face. It's just... Uh, it's very difficult to balance keeping our hospitals open and not overstressing our healthcare system, at the same time not totally destroying our economy, trying to keep people so that they could pay their rent, trying to keep people so they could get your food on the table and do testing and stride up the vaccine program. We had a lot of balls in the air at one time and it was very, very difficult to do. I think we made the best decisions we could based on the information that was available at the time. And like I say, it's, uh, I think we're going to come out better, we're going to come out stronger, and we're going to come out uh, with a better economy and a better future. Now, we had, it's a much longer interview than that. We have the full interview available for you at 8newsnow.com. We also talk uh, more about the legislative session, the vaccine lottery. As for Sheriff Joe Lombardo, he makes his official campaign announcement as a Republican for governor. That'll be on Monday at Rancho High. Meanwhile, former Senator Dean Heller is putting out feelers about his own run for governor. The Republicans been speaking to rural county Republican events with other announced candidates. He spoke in Elko June 12th and acknowledged he is considering a run. Uh, Heller also made an appearance up in Churchill County last month. He's kept a low profile since losing his Senate seat to Democrat Jackie Rosen in 2018. U.S. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh visited Las Vegas this week. He pitched the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan. Secretary Walsh toured several local unions, including the Culinary Academy of Las Vegas. Former, the, the former mayor of Boston was also part of a labor union before he jumped into politics. He described the importance of retraining people, saying many hospitality workers are learning new skills because some industries are slow to bounce back. 
And you think about convention center businesses across the country, um, you know, it's 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 easy to shut it down because it's you have to shut it down. It's harder to get it going. It's like kind of like an old engine getting it cranked back up again. And, and but I, I do feel that you know President Biden is, is is laser focused on getting our economy going, getting the economy cranking. Walsh says recovering from a pandemic is unlike recovering from a recession. People, he says, still have health concerns and child care concerns that have to be dealt with. The federal government is launching a new tool to help you file for the new child tax credit. It's part of President Biden's American Rescue Plan and gives families hundreds of dollars per child every month. In order to qualify, you have to make $75,000 or less if you're single or $150,000 or less if you're married. Families with a child under six will get $300 a month. Families with children between six and 17 years old will get $250 for each child. Democratic Congressman Stephen Horsford says more than 90% of families in his district here in Southern Nevada are eligible. I was listening uh, to one of the um, parents in my district who has two young daughters. You know, he's going to make sure that one gets uh, their, their eyeglasses and the other get to go see the dentist. That's how parents are going to use this money is for the benefit of their kids and to cover essential expenses. Um, sometimes that's very essential, like housing and food. And in other cases, it may be just being able to do that little something extra that they weren't able to do because things have been tight for so many families. If you did not file taxes this year, you can still claim the credit on the IRS's website. We have a link to that over at 8newsnow.com. A longtime UNLV professor who was a passionate and influential advocate for growth here in Southern Nevada has passed away. Dr. Robert Lang lost his battle with cancer. Here's some video from one of the many interviews he did with us here on Politics Now and for 8 News Now. Dr. Lang was executive director of Brookings Mountain West and the Lindsay Institute over at UNLV. He was one of the main policy analysts behind the UNLV School of Medicine, the new one, the Kerkorian School, Allegiant Stadium, and other major projects in the Valley. Dr. Lang was 62 years old. Coming up next here on Politics Now, looking at the next election. I know and appreciate your question, but I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Up next, we try to ask the White House press secretary about Nevada's attempt to hold the first president. Farm food ain't fast food. Welcome back to Politics Now. With elections and voting on the forefront of the national conversation, Nevada and other states are making changes to how our elections work. But a recent Monmouth poll found that about a third of Americans still think Joe Biden won the 2020 election because of voter fraud. 
The I-Team's David Charnge spoke with White House Pest Secretary Jen Psaki about that and the possibility of Nevada holding the nation's first presidential primary. Nevada was a state, obviously, that the president carried in, in 2020, um, a state where our Republican Secretary of State found, you know, uh, I can count the amount of voter fraud allegations on, on, you know, two hands. However, there are still people in this state who believe that the election was stolen. Uh, what does the president say about that kind of, of kind of stuff when there are people who, with no evidence, seem to think that, you know, he's somehow not the president? What, what does he say, you know, that, that we don't see about this stuff? Look, I think the president's view is, one, uh, the facts are on his side. Uh, as you noted, uh, voter fraud is not a widespread issue across the country, in Nevada or in any other state across the country. Uh, and a lot of these voter restriction laws that some legislatures are pushing forward are based on what he considers and what we consider the big lie, which is, which is this notion that there was fraud. And what we know is that there were dozens of court cases fought over this, uh, and none of them overturned the outcome of the election, one that the American people voted for. Now, he feels that the most effective role he can play is by governing for all people, by showing people that government can work for them, uh, that he doesn't look at uh, getting the pandemic under control, putting people back to work, uh, making sure families have assistance through a political prism. That's the role he can play. But it is something that society is going to have to continue to fight back against, which is false information and arguments about uh, voting fraud that aren't true. Would the president like to see Nevada be the first in the nation primary state? I know and appreciate your question, but I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole uh, or weigh in on the political order or, or presidential nominating process. We're pretty focused on the job he's doing as president. At least she knows and acknowledges the question. Back to the drawing board. Coming up next on Politics Now, what's the next step on election reform as it's stalled in Congress? Plus, a new Nevada law that protects hairstyle discrimination at work. This week, Senate Republicans stopped an election reform measure that was being pushed by Democrats. The For the People Act would have made major changes to voting and election efforts. It was a party line vote, 50 50, not to proceed with debate on the measure. So that's 10 votes shy of the majority required to move forward. Democrats say this law would remove hurdles to voting. Republicans say it's a federal overreach. It is a solution in search of a problem. We will uh, put an end to it. Uh, here in the Senate. And in response to Donald Trump's lies, 
Republican state legislatures immediately launched the most sweeping voter suppression efforts in at least 80 years. The question is what Democrats will do next. A growing number of progressive groups say it's time to change Senate rules to allow Democrats to pass this measure without Republicans. At least two Democrats say, though, they're not on board with that. There's been a lot of heavy, heavy lobbying for and against that election reform bill. The most memorable was in support of the measure, featuring Katy Perry and Orlando Bloom in a dystopian future. You are our only hope. The America you know doesn't exist in our future. Democracy is dead. We have no voice. The regime watches our every move. It started when voter suppression ran wild all over America. The voting rights bills died in the Senate. So that was paid for by a PAC called Represent Us in favor of the For the People Act. Now, we told you earlier about a national Monmouth poll about election-related issues this week. I wanted to share a couple of other opinions about laws being debated right now. So people said they support national guidelines allowing vote by mail and in-person voting with 69% as you see there in favor. Meanwhile, 80% support requiring voters to show photo ID in order to vote. That was also 84% among non-white voters. This week, President Joe Biden announced a bipartisan deal with senators on an infrastructure measure. The agreement mostly invests in traditional infrastructure projects across the country. As Jesse Tenor explains, top congressional leaders made it clear this is not a done deal. We have a deal. A rare display of bipartisanship on the White House grounds Thursday, as Republicans and Democrats and the president agreed on a nearly $1 trillion infrastructure plan. To put people to work all across the country. The Senate plan provides money for everything from roads to high-speed internet to electric utilities. There's going to be a lot of jobs that come out of this. Louisiana Republican Bill Cassidy stressed the agreement also protects against extreme weather. Investment and the resiliency that will be essential as we address our changing environment. The plan's lead negotiators, Ohio Republican Rob Portman and Arizona Democrat Kirsten Cinema, were able to merge their two parties' priorities. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we came up with a good compromise. We all gave some to get some. The group landed on pay fors that include unused COVID-19 relief funds and $580 billion in new revenue from things like tax law enforcement and customs user fees. Without raising a cent from earners below $400,000. But the deal comes with strings attached. The president and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi say Democrats will also forge ahead with plans to pass a larger bill. It would address human infrastructure, like child care and education, using a procedure called reconciliation. There ain't going to be an infrastructure bill unless we have the reconciliation bill. That bigger bill can pass without Republican support if every Senate Democrat votes yes. Jesse Tenor, Tenor reporting there. Next on Politics Now, ending discrimination. How a Nevada law will protect women's hairstyle choice in the workplace.
please? Nareva, think bigger. You're watching Politics Now. Hair-based discrimination is now illegal in Nevada. Governor Steve Sisolak signed the Crown Act into law this month. It stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Bianca Holman explains the impact of this new legislation. Hair is a form of expression, identity, and a connection to heritage, especially in the black community. For me, hair is an accessory. You should be able to wear it how you want. It's beautiful, though. It's a very, like night and day type of thing. If it's wet, the shrinkage is one way. When it's blow dried, it's another way. For many black women, there's a shared experience growing up. Memories of straightening coily and curly hair through the use of chemicals or heat, oftentimes in order to fit a European beauty standard. Yendra Dixon, who works in a professional setting, says she was met with comments from former co-workers during her hair journey. Definitely microaggressions. Can I touch it? Um, you know, what did you do, you know, when, uh, when black women put in braids, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what happened to your hair? Because it has transitioned into something completely different. Black women are 80% more likely to have changed their hair from its natural state to fit into the office. And they're also one and a half times more likely to be sent home from work because of their hair. That's according to the 2019 Dove Crown Research Study. Professional stylists say the pressure to conform is damaging. And we as stylists, we don't want to straighten that much. We'll tell you, like, don't put that much heat on your hair. It's going to damage your hair. You're going to lose your hair. Senators Dina Neal and Dallas Harris pushed for the Crown Act, protecting those who wear hairstyles like braids, locks, and twists. People lack education when it comes to hair. We are typically judged based off how our hair looks. People who don't understand, um, maybe have only had the influences of their families, they take those biases into the workplace. The Crown Act is life-changing. I think it's super important. I think it's amazing. As we break the chains of slavery, as we liberate ourselves as a people, as we liberate ourselves as a community, um, and as we work with our allies to bring equity and justice to, um, to our community, it is imperative that we let Black women be free, that we let them do what they want with their hair. Bianca Holman, 8 News Now. We have a statement from State Senator Dina Neal on the passing of the Crown Act over at 8newsnow.com. That'll do it for Politics Now this week. We thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you back here on Saturday. Take care.